time. When the principal disappeared, her eyes went back to the book in her lap, end quote. So for the remainder of my time, I wanna look closely at two pieces of this scenario, the teacher and the textbook. I'll offer a short reading of Ms. McGee's effort to escape the official curriculum by way of the hidden transcript literally resting in her lap and how Carter G. Woodson's textbook, The Negro in Our History, rendered a competing narrative of black life that defied racist school policies and curriculum. So the teacher, Tessie McGee's method of instruction constitutes a textbook example of what I'm calling fugitive pedagogy. Her concealed lesson plan rejected degrading representations of black life in official school curricula and such refusal manifested in physical form. McGee's public display of the official outline was a masked performance of complicity, an embodied text that accompanied the subversive and spoken content of her lesson. McGee's physical act of switching text also communicated important messages to her students, demonstrating how defiance could at times be disguised by public performances of deference to the coercive regime of school authorities. Teachers like Ms. McGee gained access to alternative scripts of knowledge through what the sociologist Alden Morris has called insurgent intellectual networks. And these were institutions like Carter G. Woodson's Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, which he founded in 1915, but also Black teacher associations. Such organizations comprised a veiled yet networked Black educational world. One where Black Americans said one thing, but often did another. Because given rampant anti-Black violence, the true political intentions that undergirded Black educational strivings were rarely on full display. African-Americans responded, often in quiet, calculated acts of resistance against an oppressive school setting that reflected a world order built on Black subjection. Fugitive pedagogy was a collective endeavor, even when it manifested as these kinds of individual acts of practice. For example, the principal who was entering Ms. McGee's classroom was a Black man named J.L. Jones. And the record suggests that Principal Jones supported the inclusion of Black history and culture at Webster Parish. He was a leading member in the Louisiana Colored Teachers Association, which had explicitly endorsed Carter G. Woodson and his work. And Woodson regularly appeared on programs at the annual meetings of Black teacher professional organizations at both the state and the national level. And the documents on the screen display Carter G. Woodson's life membership um, card in what was formerly called the National Association of Teachers in Colored Schools, but then changed his name to the American Teachers Association. But also the newspaper clipping that you see to the right displays Carter G. Woodson appearing at the annual state teacher associations. This is for Tennessee, but we have plenty of accounts of him in places like Louisiana, in Georgia, in Texas, so on and so forth. So given this history, it is not implausible then to consider that Principal Jones and Ms. McGee may have very likely conspired together, the, te the principal testing the teacher to ensure that she could protect herself and the school if a white official entered the room. Wearing the mask, as Paul Lawrence Dunbar called it, had long been part and parcel of black teachers' professional disposition. In black segregated schools, the intrusion of white surveillance had a hand in shaping school ecology. It was not atypical for white people to drop by unannounced during the school day, either to show off their Negro school to visitors or for some routine inspection. Such visits were primarily meant to demonstrate power, which was essential to reproducing domination. So this is to say, that the person walking into Ms. McGee's classroom could just as easily have been a white school official. Black educators walked a tightrope when challenging such oppressive schooling contexts, because if they were to fall or be caught, there was no safety net to catch them. 
In fact, just a few years prior, the white school board in Muskogee, Oklahoma, which was heavily influenced by the Ku Klux Klan, they had learned that Carter G. Woodson's textbook, textbook was being used in the local black high school. The books were confiscated, teachers were reprimanded, and the principal was threatened and forced to resign. And after reading the textbook, the school board, quote, expressed horror and surprise that such a work should have crept into our Negro schools, end quote. The school board went on to assure their white constituents that they would be more vigilant moving forward, stating, quote, we must not take in teachers who will create discord by teaching isms of any sort, end quote. And examples of this kind of violent oversight are plentiful and they move forward and backwards in time as far as black teachers are concerned. Black teachers were routinely targeted and fired for challenging white authority. Some notable examples being Ida B. Wells, who was fired in Memphis, Tennessee in the 1890s, John W. Davison, who was fired in the early 20th century in Georgia, Anna Julia Cooper around the same time in Washington, DC, and of course, Septima Clark, who was fired in South Carolina. And yet, there were teachers who lost more than their jobs. Harry and Harriet Moore were fired in 1946 and later killed when their home was bombed in Mims, Florida. Black teachers' awareness of such stories prompted them at times to conceal their pedagogical objectives in the presence of intrusive white power. Subjection to surveillance and violence motivated by no causal logic whatsoever was a fact of blackness. And African-American educators developed strategies to contest this reality, which ranged from broad institutional realms down to things that they did at the interpersonal and psychic levels. Fugitivity and its historical reference holds in place the realities of constraint and African-Americans straining against said confinement. It is careful not to overstate one or the other. And as the poet Fred Moten aptly notes, and I paraphrase here, escape is an activity, it's not an achievement. The possible threat of recapture always lingered. Escape was unresolved and uncertain and black teachers carried intimate knowledge of such precarity. So now the textbook. So my concern with historical framings of black education began with the textbook. I had come across a passing reference to Carter G. Woodson's textbook, one of which you see pictured on the screen being read by a group of junior high students in the 1930s in Louisiana. I was aware that Woodson played a central role in African-American studies as the second black person to get a PhD from Harvard in 1912 and as the founder of Negro History Week, as Derek mentioned earlier in 1926, in which we now celebrate today as Black History Month. But I was shocked to learn about the size of his impact on educational practice during Jim Crow in the private spaces of Black teachers' classrooms. While most accounts emphasize Woodson's role as a historian, and I'm sure many of you have heard him referred to as the father of Black history, much less has been written about Woodson's 30 year career as a public school teacher and leader among educators. And yet when we search the historical record, we learn about how Woodson fervently worked from his office at 1538 9th Street Northwest in the historic Shaw District in Washington, DC. And it's from this post where Woodson responded personally to letters written to him by individual teachers some of these teachers writing to him with historical questions, but others inquired in hushed tones about how they might strategically work to challenge curriculum standards on a local level. Woodson and his very small staff mailed textbooks to individual teachers in schools across the country. They packaged Negro history kits by hand and they shipped off decorative materials for teachers to refashion their classrooms. The wide circulation of Woodson's ideas and his curriculum materials among black teachers implied for me a much more complicated narrative 
than those suggested by pervasive images, which I'm sure we've all seen, the, of the pervasive images of dilapidated black schools during the Jim Crow era and the stories about the aggressive neglect of black education, these stories tend to dominate public memory and in large part academic scholarship on the subject. And what I'm saying is that that story of separate and unequal, right? That violent story of aggressive material neglect, is, I'm not saying that that's not true, it's absolutely true and it's been well documented. But what I'm saying is that there's also a much more important, rich intellectual, cultural and political history that also took place simultaneously, right? And this is the story that I'm lifting up in this book and saying that we have to be able to account for both of these things when we recall the heritage of black education. And what intrigued me most about Woodson's textbooks, as well as those written by black public schools, public school teachers before him, was their extensive commemoration of fugitive slaves. As early as 1819, as 1890, excuse me, as documented in this um, one of this, these articles that I published, black educators were found writing textbooks filled with heroic narratives about enslaved blacks who absconded plantations, those who led slave revolts, stories about black maroon communities in the dismal swamps of Virginia, Suriname, Brazil, and Jamaica, right? This international narrative that African-American teachers during the Jim Crow era are building on in their curricular imaginations. But that's not all. The fugitive slave emerged as a folk hero and cultural symbol in curricula developed by these educators. The fugitive slave also appeared in school naming practices and within commemorative ceremonies and rituals and school activities. And it was this realization that prompted my reliance on the fugitive slave archetype and on fugitive pedagogy as a theory and practice of black educational life in the United States. This is to say, this term that I'm offering fugitive pedagogy is much, much more than just some elaborate metaphor. It names a phenomenon that surfaced within the archival record at multiple levels. In fact, it was clarifying to learn that the very first black author textbooks were actually written by fugitive slaves. James W.C. Pennington, who was an escaped slave from Maryland, inaugurated this tradition in 1841. A textbook on the origins and history of the colored people represents the beginning of a formalized practice of black people striving to rewrite the system of knowledge. The fugitive slave William Wells Brown also wrote a textbook in 1863. So like newspapers, journals, and various other forms of black print culture, textbooks became tools, not only of the master, but also of the fugitive slave. And such counter readings of the world carried over to Woodson's theorizing about black education. And if some of you recall in his iconic text, The Miseducation of the Negro, Woodson wrote, quote, how starting out after the Civil War, the opponents of freedom and social justice decided to work out a program which would enslave the Negro's mind in as much as the freedom of body had to be conceded, end quote. So here Woodson is, su is suggesting that the political conflicts at the very core of black education were fundamentally linked to the legacies and social technologies of enslavement. And in his first book, The Negro in Our History, Woodson continues to build on this relationship between the history of slavery and the ongoing struggles and politics of black education. And he offers the following narrative. How some of these slaves learned in spite of opposition makes a beautiful story. Knowing the value of learning as a means of escape and having longing for it too because it was forbidden, many slaves continued their education under adverse circumstances, end quote. So here we see Woodson naming the entanglement of violent white opposition and the enslaved people's steady practice of learning as a means of escape, where he's offering this as a generative lesson for students and teachers during Jim Crow. Because indeed, this story of fugitive literacy among the enslaved was the origin story of Black education. At its highest calling, Black education continued to be a stealing away from and refusal of 
the American school's official protocols and curricula. And so now I want us to consider the Louisiana textbook that informed Tessie McGee's required lesson plan. Um, because I, I think that looking to what was the official and required text during this time period helps us put into perspective how radical um, of a departure Carter G. Woodson's textbooks were and also um, the kind of radical and bold intervention that Tessie McGee and teachers like her were making with their subversive and fugitive pedagogical practices. So according to the records of, of the state's Department of Education, there were two textbooks formally adopted for secondary instruction. This was Modern Times and the Living Past by Henry Elson and a book entitled An American History by Nathaniel Wright Stevenson. And as you can see from the screen, this is information that's recovered from the public school records from the State Department of Education in Louisiana. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, um, but suffice it to say that both of these texts render distorted images of black life. And I'm gonna offer a very brief account from the 10th grade textbook. In the first chapter of Modern Times, Elson wrote the following, quote, not only are almost all the civilized nations of today of the white race, but throughout all the historic ages, this race has taken the lead and has been foremost in the world's progress. He explains that almost the entire book will be devoted to the doings of the Caucasian race, or more specifically, at least nine tenths of the book must be given to an account of the Indo-European branch of the race as the Indo-Europeans have dominated the world for the past 2,500 years, end quote. So based on Louisiana's adopted curriculum, Tessie McGee and her students were narratively condemned to borrow from black studies scholar, Sylvia Winter. It deemed them to be of no human concern. So while we are unaware of the exact passages Miss McGee may have been reading from Carter G. Woodson's textbook in that scenario recalled by her student, we at least know what she was negating. Carter G. Woodson charged that the reconstitution of knowledge was a critical step in challenging violent assaults against black humanity. He professed, quote, there would be no lynching if it did not start in the schoolroom. Woodson often named this schoolroom lynching duality because it highlighted what was fundamentally at stake. Education was not just about vocational trades, developing more black professionals or bourgeois performances of citizenship. It was about insisting on black social and political life as opposed to death. It meant making legible the social disfiguring of black humanity that whiteness demands for its propping up and then refusing it through counter readings of the word and world. Pending radical reformation of the American school, Carter G. Woodson urged educators to perform bold acts of defiance. And I wanna end with a, a, a final scenario um, that comes up in the book. As I, and, and after this, we'll, uh, I'll have an opportunity to transition, to transition and invite some, com some um, conversation partners to join me. But I want to share this uh, final scenario because I think it's important. On a Friday evening in April 1942, over 2,500 delegates of the Georgia Teachers and Education Association walked up the steps and through the six pillars of Sisters Chapel at Spelman College. They gathered to hear Carter G. Woodson's opening address, where he stated, quote, do not hang your heads in shame because your face is black, for yours is a great heritage. Do not teach students away from their environment and leave them suspended in the air, but teach them with a more realistic approach, end quote. Woodson uttered these words many times before, but on this occasion, they landed in a particularly powerful way. In plain language, he declared, quote, the whole education system as applied to the Negro is wrong, end quote. Woodson went on to criticize popular geography books, representations of Africa in school curricula, and he cautioned these teachers against, as he put it, imitating whites in their methods of instruction. They must approach their work through critical study of black history and culture. Explicit engagement with structural system that undermine black attempts at freedom and justice 
needed to be named and addressed held head on. And he insisted that this was as basic as any of the fundamentals students were to learn in school. This was their work. Members of the GT and EA filled the pews inside of this historic red brick structure, brick structure of Sisters Chapel beyond capacity. There was a pristine aesthetic to the collegiate sanctuary. It's crisp white walls, wooden pews and stage, and the towering pipe organ that served as backdrop all mirrored the beauty and prestige of Spelman College. And black teachers were overflowing from the chapel. In fact, reports, accounts uh, suggest that many of them had to stand on chairs outside while leaning their weight against the brick structure and glass windows to listen in. I end with this scenario to emphasize that, that the tradition of fugitive pedagogy was never about individual teachers or thinkers. It was about a broader vision of education and justice. It was a heritage sustained by the networked world black teachers created where they shared ideas and organized around a meaningful educational agenda. The teachers and students called upon in my books are portals into a heritage of fugitive pedagogy. And I hope to have told their stories in a way that moves beyond mere description and narratives of heroic struggle. Instead, having teased out ins insights about the deeper meaning of education and Black people's struggle for human goodness and flourishing, for a new world to be and new ways to be in the world, for a new language and for a new vision. As Toni Morrison showed through her fictional character Sixo, a language is only worth speaking or writing or singing if you can see a future in it. And so I look to Black teachers of the past whose fugitive acts can teach us so much about the future. They represent a tradition that has been plundered from today's Black educators who are its rightful inheritors. And yet, all who are committed to critical pedagogy or what many refer to today as anti-racist teaching might draw inspiration from their legacy. I see the cast of characters in my book as standard bearers, a tradition passed through these teachers and their students, and their heritage is one worthy of both praise and deep study. Um, and for the sake of time, I wanna end there because I wanna make sure that we have time uh, for questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm going to um, invite the moderator and the other folks that we have here today to kind of join me in conversation. Um, but thank you for your uh, attention and for engaging with the work. And I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Givens. Even in this virtual space, we can hear the uh, rounds of applause and call and response back to you for the work that you're doing. Um, I have uh, many thoughts and many questions. I, I really, uh, first off, appreciate just how you uh, laid out the character of Black teaching and the defining of fugitivity. Um, uh, historically and uh, currently, I imagine many of us can see that, that sense of fugitivity in ourselves as Derek was stating when he uh, uh, opened up the presentation. So I want to uh, invite uh, Dr. Amina Norris, uh, Christopher Chapman, uh, Dr. Malika Hollenside uh, to join us and to uh, bring their voices to the conversation, to highlight things you're saying, to pick your brain further, and uh, maybe share some thoughts themselves. Absolutely. Um, th thanks for that. And thanks for uh, joining me, uh, Dr. Morris and, and, and Brother Chris. It's good to be in conversation with you all, but love to hear any comments um, that you all might have or even questions that you have for things that I can clarify as we transition into uh, the conversation portion of today's event. Um, I'll just start with, um, mind blown i just want to thank you i um i really really appreciate it and feel very um i'll say invigorated and inspired by um what we were able to learn from your presentation today and so can you um talk about your thoughts in terms of how uh, fugitive pedagogies uh, connects to uh, ideas and concepts of abolition. And I know you mentioned like how it's a rep 
sort of um, to conceive of it in terms of anti-racism, but can you share a little bit more about how you think of it in terms of abolitionist um, teaching and pedagogy? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, in terms of the abolitionist uh, pedagogy, I'm assuming that that might be referring to, I know the, uh, 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 for instance, Bettina Love books, uh, we want to do more than just survive. I know it comes out and talks about abolitionist pedagogy that has to do with kind of challenging racism in school. But one of the things that I would say is that um, this story about the you know fugitive uh, uh, literacy and fugitive educational practices of Black folks during the period of enslavement was always already an abolitionist project, right? Um, well, one of the things that I that I think it, that I you know that comes across very clear in the historical record is that when we think about many of the kind of Black folks who were get, engaging in the abolitionist circuit whether they be teachers or whether they be speakers, um, were part, some, many of them were teachers, right? Um, I, you know, I think about folks like the story of Frederick Douglass, who becomes one of the most kind of influential abolitionists during the, um, during the 19th century, but his story of fugitive literacy, right? It's from, it's from Frederick Douglass that one of, my, one of the early kind of points that I kind of came across when I was reading his, his narrative, when he says, um, after Master Hugh Aud overhears his mistress teaching a young Douglas how to read and write, he, he gets upset with his wife. He says, what are you doing? This will unfit him for his duties as a slave, right? He says, if you teach him now how to read, he'll wanna know how to write. And this being accomplished, he'll be running away with himself, right? That's literally, a, that's the quote that Douglas recalls from Master Huard, he'll be running away with himself, right? Theft of mind was always inex, you know, inextricably linked to the theft of body when it comes to the predicament of enslavement and the position of enslaved people, which is why one of the things that I'm saying is that there's this, this early politics of black education that develops with fugitive literacy, right? Black people climbing into pits in the ground in the middle of the night um, to learn to read and write or stealing away to the woods to learn to read and write and have a school, carrying books under, underneath their hat, right? These fugitive practices, are all bound up with the kind of constrained realities of Black people's embodied lived realities, right? And these folks, you know, there's, you know, Ishmael Reed's, it's a fictional narrative, but in Ishmael Reed's novel, Flight to Canada, he says, the first who learned to read was the first to run away, right? Um, and so this relationship between running away and literacy is very much so there in the Black literary tradition in terms of novels and writing, but also in the lived histories of these people, many of whom, were, that were enslaved who became kind of writers and scholars were a part of the abolitionist movement. We also have teachers like Susan Paul, who was a teacher in Boston, right? Who wrote the first kind of, you know, um, kind of, you know, black bio, the first black uh, author of a, of a biography, right? Was a teacher who taught school in Boston and, what, and was an abolitionist, a part of an abolitionist family. Charlotte Ford and Grimke was an abolitionist, right? Who, um, you know, when teaching during the Civil War talks about teaching black students in the South Carolina Sea Islands and talking about why she insisted on teaching them about Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution, why she insisted on teaching them about what one of their own color had done, right? This is in a letter that she's writing. So I would say that the project of abolition cannot be understood apart from the narrative of fugitive slaves and the educational practices that they cultivated that had to do with chipping away at the very institution of slavery. Um, and so that, that's one of the things that I would offer as, as a historical thinker that I have to ground it in, in that way um, and, to, and to position it in that way. In terms of what abolitionist teaching means today, I'm, I can't necessarily speak to that because I think there are competing interests that some folks might have, right? You know, there's a conversation around abolishing prisons, right? There's a conversation, some people would advocate ab abolishing schools, right? As we, abolishing public education. So um, in the sense that if it's an abolitionist pedagogy that has to do with the unfinished project of black emancipation and freedom, I understand that, but the language of abolition in the current moment as it pertains to political movements can mean a number of things. And it would, I, it would require me to know what specifically teachers are referring to um, in subscribing to that particular model of teaching. Sorry, that was, that was a very long way of answering your question, which was a great question. Um, <laughs> I haven't received up until this point, but I hope I answered it uh, in some way. 
That was a phenomenal answer. So I, I absolutely, I, I couldn't agree one more. And I thank you for putting everything in a historical context because it's such a rich history and so important. And so um, I'm gonna open it up. So um, and turn it back over to Dale to see if um, other questions. Yeah, that's a, a, a great, great question and a great, great answer. And uh, just to say, even though we're in this Hollywood Square space, all the conversation doesn't have to flow through me. So um, anyone, please uh, um, feel free. And I'm also monitoring uh, questions that arise from uh, participants as well. Dr. Givens, I'm hoping that you can touch on, not from your presentation, but from the book, the idea of the oppositional gaze. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, and I think this comes up in the chapter that's about black students, um, right? And this idea of the black student as witness. Um, you know, for, for me, when I, when I wrote my dissertation, the language of fugitive pedagogy did not appear at all. Um, the story of Tessie McGee was not in my dissertation, but I only encountered the story of Tessie McGee because there's a, um, there's a black woman who's a part of the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, um, who told me about, you know, these old recordings from Asala, this is Carter G. Woodson's organization. She had these old recordings of former members of the organization talking about their relationship to Woodson. And, you know, she said, you know, I have some of these materials at my church if you want to come out here to um, Maryland and take a look at them. So, you know, I went there and I'm watching these uh, videos that she has set up in this kind of storage room in, the, um, in one of the storage rooms at her church. And I'm watching this video of, of, of an adult Jerry Moore recalling his teacher, Tessie McGee, from years before who, you know, you know, and then proceed to insert the narrative that I opened the talk with. Um, and so for me, that became a completely new lens for what I needed to account for in telling this intellectual and social history. It wasn't just talking about how good these textbooks were and why they were so important and black teachers, you know, writing about black history early on and thinking about challenging curriculum um, and establishing their own system of knowledge. That intellectual history was very, very important. But when I came across that narrative about how this, you know, one scene in this particular moment in this student's experience impacted him, the fact that he saw that, right, but also that he was able to interpret everything that was happening in that moment. This teacher negotiating power is because he also had this lens that was shaped by the Jim Crow, this Jim Crow reality, right? He understood what it meant for Black people to navigate power, right? Black children saw Black adults having to navigate white authoritative figures who could insert, you know, inflict violence upon them in the context of rural Louisiana in the 1930s, right? Um, these students were aware of that. And so understanding why Tessie McGee was subversively reading from this textbook, and or sometimes he also said sometimes she would stand the textbook next to the other materials that they were given to read and talk about, and essentially putting these texts in conversation talking and, and in contention with one another, right? Um, but the oppositional gaze is, is lift, it's coming from Bell Hooks and her writing about, you know, black people's looking back and recognizing how they are seen um, and stigmatized in the world, right? And that while you have all of these narratives that represent black life uh, in, in that kind of shape, perceptions about, you know, black people, black people are both aware of that, but also looking at a world that is seeing them in that way, right? And also, uh, and, and challenging that perspective. So this oppositional gaze has to do with a different way of looking, not only at knowledge, right? Tessa McGee engaging in this oppositional gaze, but also black students being privy to the kind of critiques that black people engaged in around white supremacy in the context of Jim Crow, even when they didn't openly kind of say that in certain moments, right? But that oppositional gaze was important for, the, you know, how Jerry Moore made sense of what was happening, right? So I, I privilege the perspective of black students. I privilege their witnessing of what they saw happen um, and saying that that's actually important for the historical record, right? Expanding the historical record to account for black student witnessing um, and what they, recall, what they recall their teachers doing was important because it offers an oppositional narrative or a counter narrative to what mainstream historical records would likely um, present in terms of black teachers and what they were doing the, during this time period, right? Um, so that's a little bit about how I'm borrowing the language of the oppositional gaze from bell hooks to, to become an 
analytical resource to talk about black students' positionality um, in the context of Jim Crow schools, right? Their politics of looking back, right? And seeing these things and then leaving a record of it for someone like me as a historian to be able to recover it, um, to do the work that I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's excellent, that thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question, Ruth, and for being a deep reader. Also, you know, reading that, which is tucked away in the sixth chapter of the book. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm going to call that out. I appreciate it. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to do the same, actually, um, because part of the direction of the questions is uh, getting into um, your influences and, and uh, folks you've drawn upon to uh, perform the work that you've done. Um, a, a bit ago, you referenced Ishmael Reed, who is uh, one of my favorite authors and uh, essayists. Um, and I appreciate the reference to Flight to Canada. So in terms of Ishmael Reed, Ishmael Reed is also fond of the motif of the trickster in its role in uh, teaching and storytelling and also fugitivity. So um, you might have drawn upon that metaphor, which is more than a metaphor, but you, 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 you drew a landed on fugitivity. Can you talk about those two uh, motifs? Absolutely. So one of the kind of first important interventions around fugitivity in Black study scholarship comes from an early essay by Nate Mackey. Um, and I'm talking about in terms of like the analytical frame, but Nate Mackey has an article, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the year, I think it's 1992, it's called From Now to Verb. But he's writing about um, Fugitivity, he introduces this idea in talking about some of the themes that comes through in Zora Neale Hurston's writing and her short stories. Um, Zora Neale Hurston is also, you know, you know, prior to someone like Ishmael Reed, but in the black literary uh, tradition in general, you see this motif of the trickster figure, whether that is um, in the kind of, you know, slave narratives to the kind of Ishmael Reed's text, but also Zora Neale Hurston writing about black folklore and, you know, High John the Conqueror, right? Or big folks writing about Br'er Rabbit stories so on and so forth. Or the enslaved people saying things, you know, things like, got one mind for me, another for the master to see, right? Those sorts of um, aspects of black vernacular culture um, informed my conceptualization of the, of the framework of fugitive pedagogy, right? To think about fugitivity as an important part, a frame for thinking about black cultural and political life, right? So you have also Zora Neale Hurston writing in one of her um, texts, uh, you know, she says, you know, the, the, the white man might, he, he can read my writing, but he sure can't read my mind, right? Um, but this idea that there's this duality, right? Paul Lawrence Dunbar, we wear the mask, right? Is all about this trickster motif, right? This um, subversive clandestine politics that are very much so a part of the early history of black education. And, and as I'm arguing in the book, continue to be a part of black educational politics after emancipation because black education continued to be met by violent white resistance, right? Between 1866 and 1876, over 630 black schools were burned down, right? So even as it's legal for black people to attend school at this point where the majority of them are in the South, it continues to be met by violent white resistance, which means that black people continue to have to be cautious about how they express their political aspirations their educational strivings, right? And so this trickster motif, this feud, this aspect of black fugitive life becomes part of the, the, the educational practices, which is also why, you know, them, them naming schools after fugitive slaves, right? You know, my high school teacher, I re interviewed her recently, she's from Hot Springs, Arkansas, but attended, you know, the Frederick Douglass, the Frederick Douglass School and was educated in the Jim Crow South. Carter G. Woodson attended the Frederick Douglass School in, you know, in um, Huntington, West Virginia, right? Uh, we have someone like Nathan Hare who becomes the first chair and director of black studies at SF State who graduated from the Toussaint Louverture School in Oklahoma, right? You have black folks in Missouri naming schools after Toussaint Louverture. And, and in the school board meetings, they just say, oh, we just, this is a military leader. They don't say anything about why this is important and how they're also writing about the Haitian revolution in their scholarship. So we constantly see them engaging in this kind of negotiation of power um, to push forward their cause. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, so other panelists, other uh, members, questions for or comments for Dr. Gibbons? 
Um, I just lift up extreme admiration for um, my brother Jarvis um, as there's this assault on Black studies, on culturally responsive pedagogy, on critical race theory. This book, to me, in the spirit of the work we do um, around redesigning school systems is exactly what we need to provide the intellectual history uh, and knowledge uh, for us to think about the strategies uh, to redesign schools. Actually, Jarvis, if I had one question, brother, I just, what advice or what insight could you give, given your, your studies, that we, how could we leverage this book as we're engaging um, school boards and systems leaders on how they redesign in service of Black, Brown, Indigenous youth? What advice would you have to an organization like Kingmakers of Oakland? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think a lot of the work that you're doing is, is excellent, but I, I think that one of the things that was so, so impressive to me when I was reading this book is the rich intellectual culture that these teachers modeled. They modeled that their work was not just to be practitioners, to kind of go into classrooms and to engage in the procedural aspects that, is off, that teachers are often taught they're supposed to do, but they were modeling what it meant to be scholars of the practice, right? They were questioning the information that came before them and they had spaces in the Black teacher association that they created to engage in intellectual struggle, right? Where they're engaging with the thinking of people like Anna Julia Cooper and W.B. Du Bois, Mary McLeod Bethune and Woodson, who's, who are members of these organizations, right? And who are addressing them regularly. And we see these teachers engaging with these ideas to talk about how they can merge these things with the things that they're doing in the classroom. So this model of kind of sustained study is something that I think, you know, educators need to talk about because we live in a moment where teachers are deprofessionalized. The work of teachers are not, is not necessarily thought of as inherently intellectual, right? The practitioner aspect, of the, just the doing, right, is what's emphasized, um, not necessarily the kind of thinking and the reflexive aspect of what needs to be done there. So I would say that leveraging this book means, you know, talking about this book as a model of what it means to be a teacher where the intellectual side of teaching and the humanizing aspect of the work is front and center. And, it is and it's an empowering narrative for teachers to do their own professional ide identity work, right? How do teachers come to understand who they are and what they're doing and to cultivate their professional identity? What, what, what traditions, what educational traditions are they offered to see themselves in relationship to? Most teacher training programs don't engage in historical study at all, let alone these particular issues about black teachers. And I think that this is an important um, legacy for teachers to see themselves in relationship to. And it, and it speaks to the, 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 the kind of higher moral and ethical demands of, of the vocation of teaching, right? More than just a job, but the vocation, right? This calling of what it means to be a, an educator um, in society in pursuit of justice. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Chris, for uh, that question and for bringing out some of those additional thoughts. Uh, we are coming to a, a close in the program. Um, and so I would like to surface a question from participants uh, directed to you, Dr. Givens. And uh, I, I, I chuckle because it's what I was asking you about before we started. Uh, the question is about your current work and uh, where you're headed now. Yeah, so thanks, thanks for that question. Uh, so. Uh, it's a, a number of directions. One is the Black Teacher Archive, which we were talking about before, which is the effort to create this online portal preserving the publications of colored teacher associations. We, you know, the first one existed in 1861, and we know that they existed up until the time they were forced to integrate themselves out of existence in the late uh, 1960s. But these organizations began publishing monthly or quarterly journals, most of them beginning in the 1920s, the project is, is locating all of those materials across states, digitizing them to make them available for research in a kind of an online portal to both preserve this information, make it available for researchers, but also as a site to engage um, teachers and education activists as well in this history. Um, in terms of like writing, you know, I, I'm finishing a book that's a narrative, uh, that's a narrative uh, historical text about the experience of black students. So it's a book tracing what it has meant to be a black student in American schools through black student, through the oppositional gaze, if you will, um, thinking with group of black students based on uh, autobiographical accounts, oral histories, and uh, you know, archival materials from the 1800s up and through 
the, um, you know, the late uh, 20th century. So kind of offer a narrative of black student experience in American school through their voices, through historical um, materials that give us access to their voices to narrate that history. Um, that's a text. And then I'm also, you know, completing a book that's about revising the origin story of American education. So looking at the relationship between black education, native education and white education in early America um, and how these three racialized histories of education in the US are often treated separately um, or really the black and native experience is seen as an anomaly or at the margins. But this text is gonna be showing how they're actually quite interrelated, right? How this, this you know, the theft of native land directly funded um, early school funds in various states, how enslaved labor was used to build schools, how some folks sold slaves from their estates and kind of used those funds to kind of establish local school funds um, for the building of common schools for white to white benefits, right? Um, so that's the, th those are some of the directions that the work is, that my work is moving in. Wow, rich, rich, rich work. Uh, it will inform all of us. Just the uh, often quoted statement, the school wasn't built for us. Uh, you're going to give us the uh, information to really substantiate that assertion. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Givens. Uh, we are coming now to a final close to the program. Um, you've enriched us and uh, we'll continue to study your work and look forward to what you're coming out with next. Uh, thank you also to the participants on the panel, uh, Dr. Norris, uh, Mr. Chapman, uh, Dr. Hollandside, uh, we thank you for being here. Thank you, Dr. Watson, for facilitating the program. And thank you to all of our sponsors. Uh, please recall that uh, the next session of the Leading with Justice series will be Tuesday, November 9th with Dr. Kenjis Watson. Uh, and again, uh, that will be moderated by uh, Professor Alma Flores. Um, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. And if I can say one thing, I know um, Underground Books is a uh, is a bookseller in the Sacramento area who we've partnered, who I've partnered with before on some past events. But if there are folks who want to get the book and would prefer not to purchase it through Amazon or something like that, you can um, purchase the book through Underground Books um, and in the Sacramento area. Um, but thank you for this space and for the very deep uh, engagement um, and look forward to building with some of you all in the future. All right. That's right. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you. Thank you, Jarvis. Thank you so much. Somebody that just loves to learn and another child grows up to be somebody you just love to burn. Mom loves the both of them. You see it's in the blood.